Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. My name is Simone. Um, as Dr. Bailey Stanton said, I'm one of the medical officers at Helen Joseph, and I spent a short period of time at Rahima Musa as well. Um, while I was there, we were um, confronted with an interesting case that sort of sparked interest in this very interesting topic. Right, so today's topic is hypothyroidism and thyroid storm. Interestingly enough, having been at Drahima, um, of course, most pregnant patients or pregnancy itself can be um, a precipitant for a lot of medical conditions. And therefore, it's important for us to be comfortable with managing emer emergency medical conditions. Um, and we'll see how thyroid pathology in particular is um, quite relevant in terms of obstetric and gynae um, patients. So this is just an outline for the talk. We're going to discuss some anatomy and phys, some important definitions, signs and symptoms, which I'm sure you're all quite comfortable with. And then very importantly, scales and scoring systems that are going to help us decide when we need to initiate this life-saving definitive management um, and then the management itself. Right, so starting off with uh, anatomy and physiology as always, um, like most endocrine systems, we have negative feedback with regards to the thyroid system, a hypothalamus releasing TRH to the anterior pituitary gland, which releases TSH, and um, this stimulates the thyroid to release T3 and T4. Um, of note, this is a negative feedback system, so these hormones then shut um, the previous hormone off, the production of that hormone off. And then we have our T4 and our T3 peripherally, majority being T4, which is more weakly active than our T3, and peripherally having a conversion from T4 to T3. This will all become relevant when we discuss management, of course. And then that little diagram in the bottom corner is a thyroid hormone synthesis, where importantly, iodide is taken up into our, our thyroid cells and combined with thyroglobulin, all of this being catalyzed by thyroid peroxidase. And just an important aspect to stress here is that this iodide uptake is also a negative feedback type mechanism where excess iodide can uh, shut off the um, ongoing uptake of more iodide. And this is going to become important once again when we discuss the pharmacology of hypothyroidism. So there's that diagram. Once again, I'm sure you are all familiar from second year med school with this diagram. So this is again something I, I hope we're all quite comfortable with. Um, the most important function of the thyroid being metabolism. So it alters, speeds up our metabolic processes such as lipolysis and gluconeogenesis. Um, and this in turn affects all of these other systems, which we are going to see manifest with symptoms. So growth and development uh, of most importance in children, respiratory um, in terms of our um, O2 utilization and our CO2 um, production when we talk about metabolism and metabolic pro uh, processes. MSK in terms of muscle catabolism and anabolism once again as a source of uh, metabolic um, substrates, CNS and mood, and then very importantly for our hypothyroid emergencies, our cardiovascular functions, and it increases the number of beta adrenergic receptors, which we will see has some, allows sympathetic stimulation in the heart, and we will discuss on the next slide what that means. So as discussed, an increase in basal metabolic rates and availability of our substrates, increased O2 consumption and CO2 production, and thus patient, patients working to increase that tidal volume and blow off that CO2, protein catabolism, predominantly in our proximal muscles, causing that proximal myopathy, mood in hypothyroidism, tending towards agitation and at times seizures. And then in terms of our CVS system, increased sympathetic stimulation, thus chronotropy and inotropy. And of course, 
what we'll see is that has a ceiling and where that has a ceiling may lead to uh, cardiovascular collapse or heart failure. So in the emergency department setting, it may not always be so important for us to really ascertain the cause of hypothyroidism. However, it is just important to have uh, some knowledge of common causes of hypothyroidism. And particularly with Graves' disease, which is quite a common cause, we have our pathognomonic triad of symptoms, uh, which may even help us make that diagnosis if we see those particular uh, manifestations on a patient. Um, so that, of course, is our um, ophthalmoplegia, our pretubial myxedema, and our thyroid acropachy, which we'll, I will show you in a nice diagram, which is coming in a couple of slides. Um, and just a nice framework to think of most endocrine issues is our primary, secondary, and tertiary causes. So either at the level of the, the organ itself, so at the thyroid level, at the pituitary level, or at the hypothalamus level. And then another way to break it down nicely is to think of infective, oncologic, um, inflammatory, etc. Uh, and then lastly, just something that I wanted to mention with relevance to Rahima Musa is that beta HCG actually has a structural homology to TSH. And so conditions where we have particularly high levels of beta HCG, these patients may be prone to HCG mediated thyrotoxicosis, which I thought was quite interesting and uh, which means this presentation might be more common in a, a gynae and obstetric setting. So we will be now speaking about um, the actual manifestations of these deranged um, hormone presentations and that's thyrotoxicosis and thyroid storm. So important definitions, which are sometimes used interchangeably, but which are not interchangeable in fact. Hypothyroidism refers to the biochemical diagnosis, which is an increase in th uh, circulating thyroid hormone levels, whereas thyrotoxicosis is the clinical manifestation thereof. So the signs and symptoms induced by the hormones inappropriate activation in the tissue. And then thyroid storm or thyrotoxicosis crisis is the acute life-threatening manifestation of that. So the exaggerated presentation of thyrotoxicosis where you have um, end organ failure. Just importantly, I think to note is that in terms of differentiating thyrotoxicosis and thyroid storm, there's no particular lab value that's going to say um, above this thyroid hormone level, you are going to present in storm, whereas below you are not. So I think that is where it's important to note that scoring systems become integral in helping you decide whether you're in a thyroid storm or you have an impending thyroid storm and you should consider starting the, the de definitive management for that. So signs and symptoms, we've kind of spoken a bit about this, but I just thought these diagrams were very helpful. There in pink, you have the particular Graves' disease symptoms. So your goiter, your thyroid acropachy, um, your myxedema, pretubial myxedema, and all of the eye sort of manifestations, so proptosis, diplopia, etc. And then the rest of the diagram has our more general hypothyroid signs and symptoms. And then this diagram, which sort of speaks to similar signs and symptoms I just thought was quite nice because it goes into the pathophysiology of each of those symptoms, signs and symptoms. So I'll just pause there for a second if you want to have a look at that. Okay. And this table <clears throat> once again mentions similar signs and symptoms, which I think we have covered nicely. Right, so our scoring system. So like I said, because it's not always clear, there's not a um, biochemical way to delineate between thyroid storm and thyrotoxicosis, we use scoring systems to help us. So 
the more commonly used score is the birch Witalski score, which is quite easy to use. Um, and then there's also the Japanese Association scoring system, which categorizes patients based on aggregate presence of certain features. In terms of comparing these two scoring systems, both of which are um, available on MD Calc, which I always recommend we should download, it's very helpful. The birch Watowski score tends to be more aggressive in terms of diagnosing thyroid storm. Just important to note, if you look at all of these things listed on the birch Watowski score, if you went through recess in any emergency care setting, most patients would score very highly on this scoring system. So an important point is that this system needs to be used in context so where you have a patient that you feel appropriately might be in a thyroid storm uh, with, re with regards to their previous history or their previous biochemical results, um, the scoring system can then be used and not just to be used blindly, uh, inappropriately on patients. And then another caveat is just that if you have a patient who doesn't necessarily score high, uh, above 45 on the system, but has organ failure who you're concerned about. Again, context is important. And in consultation with seniors or subspecs, definitive management can still be initiated if appropriate. All right, so the emergency management. Just two points I'd like to stress here is First, that sequence here, with, especially with regards to the definitive management, is incredibly important. And I will explain why, but I want that kind of to be your takeaway in the back of your mind, particularly if you are more junior um, and faced with a case like this. First of all, consult a senior and consult specs early. And that sequence is incredibly, incredibly important and can be a, a huge risk to patients if inst instituted in the incorrect sequence. And then the second point there is just treat symptomatically judiciously and do not just throw a set recipe at your patient um, as always. So as exemplified in our case, you can save a life if you recess as per ACLS protocols, even if you don't know what's going on. Um, so A, B, C, D as always. Step the patient up to a high care recess area, put them on monitors and notify senior. Consult early because a lot of these drugs are a little bit scary to use. And I think these patients are quite scary to treat. And so consulting endocrinology and cardiology can really help guide further management and dosing choices. And then of course, examination and adjuncts as always to guide management. And then before we get into the definitive management, just a, just a note to look for the precipitant. There always is one. So manage that concurrently if, if you can, whether it's sepsis, in the case of a pregnant or, or sick gynae patient, um, also get OBS and gynae involved early. If this precipitant's not immediately obvious, then thorough investigation should be done to ascertain the precipitant. Right, so step one of our definitive management, and importantly, is that it should be step one, um, and step one and step two are not interchangeable, is that we want to block synthesis of new thyroid hormone production. And that is when we use our thionamides. So these drugs block thyroid peroxidase enzyme, in that diagram we looked at earlier, which I will display on the next slide for you to sort of jog your memory. And we have two types, imidazoles and thiouracils. Generally, as far as I'm aware, we only have carbimazole really available to us. So that's an important drug to remember. I've displayed the dosage there, 40 to 60 milligrams eight hourly and also 0.5 milligrams per kg daily in peds importantly with consultation of the, the specs, of course. This drug is, however, to be avoided in pregnancy. Of course, as always, mom's life comes first. And in, when faced with an emergency, 
if it is the only drug available, it should be used. But just interesting to note that the other two drugs um, available can be used at various points in pregnancy. So methimazole in second and third trimester and propylthiouracil in first trimester. And then just a last note here that I thought was interesting is that propylthiouracil has the added benefit of also blocking peripheral conversion from T4 to T3. So that's really the only differentiating factor, as well as how many times a day one has to use the drug, which can be an important um, thing to consider if you have all three drugs available. So here's a similar but slightly different diagram to the one we saw earlier. And you can see that these thionamides block at the thyroid peroxidase um, enzyme there to prevent hormone production. Right, and then step two, one hour at least after the use of thionamides, one can use Lugol's iodine. So the dose there is 10 drops PO, NGT, PO or NGT eight hourly. And then we have a pediatric dose as well. Um, based on age, so one to two drops less than a year and um, five drops more than a year. So you might be asking yourself or you might have forgotten why sequence is so important here. And that is because of something called the wolf Tchaikov effect and the jod Basido effect. So in, in simplistic terms, it speaks to that negative feedback mechanism that I spoke about earlier with the iodide uptake, where generally excess iodide presence should shut, shut off um, continual iodide uptake, which is going to um, block further release or formation of thyroid hormone. Um, however, in certain cases, um, we can actually then stimulate overproduction of thyroid hormone where we have increased iodine. And this will, of course, cause worsening of our hypothyroidism and our symptoms. And so it can be incredibly da dangerous and push our patients over the edge. Therefore, we must first do step one and block thyroid hormone production. And then lastly, in terms of definitive management is step three where we want to block peripheral conversion from our less active T4 to our more active T3. So a nice drug, which is simple to use that we're all quite comfortable using that does this is our steroids or hydrocortisone, which we can give eight hourly, um, 100 milligrams. Um, one can also do a loading dose prior to this dose. Um, and should one not have hydrocortisone available, dexamethasone can also be used. Another drug that does this that we will see is quite helpful in terms of treating some of the symptoms of hypothyroidism, or that's rather thyrotoxicosis or thyroid storm, is propanolol, which we know is a beta blocker. So I've displayed the dose there, 60 to 80 milligrams PO or NGT for hourly, obviously titrated to effect. Just important to note, especially in these patients who may be in heart failure, that this drug is contraindicated in patients with acute decompensated heart failure with systolic dysfunction. And I've just explained why there with that little diagram. So we know that our blood pressure is our cardiac output and our systemic vascular resistance. And very importantly, we know that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. And so if we're in failure and we're at the peak of our, our heart is working as hard as it can and we uh, drop that heart rate, the patients are going to decompensate. So that's just important to consider not to use beta blockers in these patients if they are in failure. So we've now covered definitive management, um, quite a lot of information. Thereafter, as always, we will treat our patients symptomatically. And I think the most relevant and commonly seen symptoms are our cardiovascular manifestations. So I have divided it up into the various cardiovascular manifestations and the potential 
management of each one. But I think it's important to note with all of these systemic manifestations that the focus should be on treating the cause, so treating the thyroid storm itself, and hopefully that will keep these manifestations at bay, particularly with some of these more scary and complex cardiovascular symptoms um, where the drugs can be quite difficult to use and balance. To start off with definitive management may make our lives a little bit easier. So the one thing that we had like our patient um, in our initial case is tachycardia. So as mentioned, we can use our beta blockers. Propanolol, which I mentioned, also has the ad added benefit of decreasing peripheral conversion. However, esmolol is quite a nice drug to use in our critically ill patients because it can be used IV and it's very short acting, um, short on and off. And so can be titrated nicely without the concern of lingering too long if it has any unwanted effects. Our arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, um, et cetera, again, treat the cause first. However, antiarrhythmics can be considered. I would suggest for more junior staff to rather consult and uh, be advised by the medical team, cardiology, or the consultant on the floor. Um, some of the suggested drugs are digoxin, again, a scary drug at times to use, uh, which is a positive inotrope as well, um, or amiodarone, which some might think is quite an interesting drug to use um, because it itself has iodine in it. So uh, initially when I saw that this was suggested as an antiarrhythmic and hypothyroidism, I worried that it might worsen the hypothyroidism. However, if definitive management has been instituted, it should not be an issue or um, that is what is said in the literature. And then, of course, in all patients with atrial fibrillation or arrhythmia, it's important to consider thromboprophylaxis as well. And then heart failure, um, again, symptomatically, furosemide where patients are fluid overloaded, as well as NIV where needed. And in terms of hemodynamic support, um, dobutamine and noradrenaline titrated to effect is what is suggested. Specifically, noradrenaline, as it is predominantly alpha-1 targeting, so it's not going to worsen our tachycardia. But obviously, in our setting, we, we need to use what we have to um, provide hemodynamic support, which generally tends to be adrenaline and dobutamine. In terms of our neurological manifestations, to manage agitation and or seizures with benzodiazepines titrated to effect. And then importantly, pyrexia um, to use central cooling methods and specifically paracetamol. Um, salicyl salicylates such as aspirin are um, not recommended as they actually displace T4 from its binding globulin and may then cause more free T4 and worsen our hypothyroidism which I thought was quite interesting. Lastly, as always, supportive management. So judicious fluid management is the name of the game. This means replacing fluid based on clinical examination, examining the mucous membrane, skin turga, cap refill, importantly, urine output, and then our favorite ED sort of tool, ultrasound. It's advisable also to consider glycogen replacement with dextrose containing fluids. And as always um, with patients that are critically ill and in our care for a long period of time to get dietetics consultation as well. Also with critically ill patients, we can use fast hugs to help us remember all of the things we wanna think about um, in managing critically ill patients. So. Feeds, anal analgesia, sedation, thromboprophylaxis, ulcer prophylaxis, glycemic control, etc. And lastly, but not lastly at all, <laughs> is disposition. So as I mentioned, consult early, um, get the specs involved 
and on board soon so that they can hopefully consult ICU or at the very least assist in managing these very complex and very ill patients. I added in this table, um, which is actually an anesthesia table by Dr. LaRue and Dr. Radielinghase, which I thought was quite lovely. It sort of summarizes all of the things we've discussed today, which can feel like quite a, mouth, a mouthful, um, just all in one very helpful table. So I'm going to pause it there in case anyone wants to grab a screenshot or um, have a look. And while that's on the screen, um, if anyone has any questions, which hopefully I'd be able to answer, and if not me, someone else, please feel free to ask. All right, those are my references. Um, and thank you very much for listening to my talk.